Hello, and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor as we are no longer sponsored by Silicon Valley High School. This show is pre-recorded. Today, I will talk about the abolitionist Sojourner Truth, information obtained from Wikipedia Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth, born Isabella Baum Free, 1797 to November the 26th, 1883, was an American abolitionist and women's rights activist. Truth was born into slavery in Svartskill, New York, but escaped with her infant daughter to freedom in 1826. After going to court to recover her son in 1828, she became the first black woman to win such a case against a white man. She gave herself the name Sojourner Truth in 1843 after she became convinced that God had called her to leave the city and go into the countryside, testifying the hope that was in her. Her best-known speech was delivered extemporaneously in 1851 at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. The speech became widely known during the Civil War by the title, Ain't I a Woman? A variation of the original speech rewritten by someone else using a stereotypical Southern dialect where Sojourner Truth was from New York and grew up speaking Dutch as her first language. During the Civil War, Truth helped recruit black troops for the Union Army. After the war, she tried unsuccessfully to secure land grants from the federal government for formerly enslaved people, summarized as a promise of 40 acres and a mule. She continued to fight on behalf of women and African Americans until her death. As a biographer, Nell Irvin Painter wrote, at the time when most Americans thought of slaves as male and women as white, truth embodied a fact that still bears repeating among the blacks are women, among the women there are blacks. Truth was one of the 10 or 12 children born to James and Elizabeth Baumfrey. Colonel Hardenburg bought James and Elizabeth Baumfrey from slave traders and kept, the, and kept their family at his estate in a big hilly area called by the Dutch name Svartskill, just north of present-day Rifton. In the town of Esopus, New York, 95 miles north of New York City, Charles Hardenberg inherited his father's estate and continued to enslave people as a part of that estate's property. When Charles Hardenberg died in 1806, nine-year-old Truth, known as Bell, was sold at an auction with a flock of sheep for $100 to John Neely near Kingston, New York. Until that time, Truth spoke only Dutch, and after learning English, she spoke with a Dutch accent, not the stereotypical black slave English. She later described Neely as cruel and harsh, relating how he beat her day daily and once even with a bundle of rods. In 1808, Neely sold her for $105 to tavern keeper Martinus Shriver of Port Erwin, New York, who owned her for 18 months. Shriver then sold Truth in 1810 to John Dumont of West Park, New York. John Dumont raped her repeatedly and considerable tension existed between Truth and Dumont's wife, Elizabeth Waring Dumont, who harassed her and made her life more difficult. Around 1815, Truth met and fell in love with an enslaved man, man named Robert from a neighboring farm. Robert's owner, Charles Catton Jr., a landscape painter forbade, the, forbade their relationship. He did not want the people he enslaved to have children with people he was not enslaving because he would not own the children. One day, Robert sneaked over to see Truth. When Catton and his son found him, they savagely beat Robert until Dumont finally intervened. 
Truth never saw Robert again that day, and he died a few years later. The experience haunted Truth throughout her life. Truth eventually married an old enslaved man named Thomas. She bore five children. James, her first born, who died in childhood. Diana, 1815, the result of a rape by John Dumont. And Peter, 1821. Elizabeth, 1825. And Sophia, around 1826, all born after she and Thomas united. In 1799, the state of New York began to legislate the abolition of slavery. Although the process of emancipating those people enslaved in New York was not complete until July the 4th, 1827, Dumont had promised to grant Truth her freedom a year before the state emancipation, if she would do well and be faithful. However, he changed his mind. Claiming a hand injury had made her less productive. She was infuriated but continued work in spinning 100 pounds of wool to satisfy her sense of obligation to him. Later, in 1826, Truth escaped to freedom with her infant daughter Sophia. She had to leave her other children behind because they were not legally freed in the Emancipation Order until they had served as bound servants into their twenties. She later said, I did not run off, for I thought that wicked, but I walked off, believing that to be all right. She found her way to the home of Isaac Maria van Vorgener in New Paltz, who took her and her baby in. Isaac offered to buy her services for the remainder of the year until the state's emancipation took effect, which Dumont accepted for $20. She lived there until the New York State Emancipation Act was approved a year later. Truth learned that her son Peter, then five years old, had been sold by Dumont and then illegally resold to an owner in Alabama. With the help of the Van Wageners, she took the issue to court, and in 1828, after months of legal proceedings, she got back her son, who had been abused by those who were enslaving him. Truth became one of the first black women to go to court against a white man and win the case. Truth had a life-changing religious experience during her stay with the Van Wageners and became a devout Christian. In 1829, she moved with her son Peter to New York City, where she worked as a housekeeper for Elijah Pearson, a Christian evangelist. While in New York, she befriended Mary Simpson, a grocer on John Street, who claimed she had been enslaved by George Washington. They shared an interest in charity for the poor and became intimate friends. In 1832, she met Robert Matthews, also known as Prophet Matthias, and went to work for him as a housekeeper at the Matthias Kingdom Communal Colony. Elijah Pearson died, and Robert Matthews and Truth were accused of stealing from and poisoning him. Both were acquitted of the murder, though Matthews was convicted of lesser crimes, served time, and moved west. In 1839, Truth's son Peter took a job on a whaling ship called the Zone of Nantucky. From 1840 to 1841, she received three letters from him, though in his third letter he told her he had sent five. Peter said he also never received any of her letters. When the ship returned to port in 1842, Peter was not on board, and Truth never heard from him again. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group, educational resources to help reach your goals. Hello, listeners. If you're enjoying the New Heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization, please visit www.newheightseducation.org. And while you're there, check out our online store. Welcome back to the New Heights show on education. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. 
I will continue with the show with the life of abolitionist Sojourner Truth, information obtained from Wikipedia Sojourner Truth. The year 1843 was a turning point for Balm Free. She became a Methodist, and on June 1st, Pentecost Sunday, she changed her name to Sojourner Truth. She chose the name because she heard the Spirit of God calling on her to preach the truth. She told her friends, The Spirit calls me and I must go, and left to make her way traveling and preaching about the abolition of slavery. Taking, o taking along only a few possessions in a pillowcase, she traveled north, walking her way up through the Connecticut River Valley towards Massachusetts. At that time, Truth began attending Millerite Adventist camp meetings. Millerites followed the teachings of William Miller of New York, who preached that Jesus would appear in 1843 to 1844, bringing about the end of the world. Many in the Millerite community greatly appreciated Truth's preaching and singing, and she drew large crowds when she spoke. Like many others, disappointed when the anticipated second coming did not arrive, Truth distanced herself from her Millerite friends for a time. In 1844, she joined the Northampton Association of Education Industry in Florence, Massachusetts, founded by abolitionists. The organization supported women's rights and religious tolerance, as well as pacifism. There were, in its four and a half year history, a total of 240 members, though no more than 120 at any one time. They lived on 470 acres, raising livestock, running a sawmill, a gristmill and a salt factory. Truth lived and worked in the community and oversaw the laundry, supervising both men and women. While there, Truth met William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass and David Ruggles. Encouraged by the community, Truth delivered her first anti-slavery speech that year. In 1845, she joined the household of George Benson, the brother-in-law of William Lloyd Garrison. In 1846, the Northampton Association of Education and Industry disbanded, unable to support itself. In 1849, she visited John Dumont before he moved west. Truth started dictating her memoirs to her friend Olive Gilbert. In 1840 and in 1850, William Lord Garrison privately published her book, The Narrative of Sojourner Truth, A Northern Slave. That same year, she purchased a home in Florence for $300 and spoke at the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. In 1854, with proceeds from sales of the narrative and card divisity captioned, I sell the shadow to support the substance, she paid off the mortgage held by a friend from the community, Samuel L. Hill. Ain't I a Woman was taken from bhamcityschools.org. Ain't I a Woman. In 1851, Truth joined George Thompson, an abolitionist and speaker, on a lecture tour through central and western New York State. In May, she attended the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio, where she delivered her famous extemporaneous speech on women's rights, later known as Ain't I a Woman. Her speech demanded equal human rights for all women. She also spoke as a former enslaved woman, combining calls for abolitionism with women's rights and drawing from her strength as a laborer to make her equal rights claim. Sojourner Truth 1797 to 1883, an entire woman delivered 1851 Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that woman needs to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or open mud puddles or gives me any best place and ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have ploughed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And I ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne thirteen children and seen most all sold off to slavery. 
and when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What's this they call it? Member of audience whispers, intellect. That's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint, and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black there, he says, women can't have as much rights as men, cause Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman? Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking to do it. The men better let them oblige to you for hearing me. And now old Sojourner ain't got nothing more to say. Wikipedia Sojourner Truth. In the version recorded by Reverend Marias Robinson, Truth said, I want to say a few words about this matter. I am a woman's rights. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. I ploughed and reaped and husked and chopped and mowed. And can and can any man do more than that? I have heard about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as any man and can eat as much too if I can get it. I am as strong as any man that is now. As for intellect, all I can say is, if a woman has a pint and a man a quart, why can't you have a little pint full? You need not be afraid to give us our rights for fear we will take too much, for we can't take more than our pint hold. The poor men seems to be all in confusion and don't know what to do. Why, children, if you have women's rights, give it to her and you will feel better. You will have your own rights and they won't be so much trouble. I can't read, but I can hear. I have heard the Bible and have heard, I've learned that Eve caused man to sin. Well, if women upset the world, do give her a chance to set it right side up again. The lady has spoken about Jesus, how he never spurned women from him and she was right. When Lazarus died, Mary and Martha came to him with faith and love and besought him to raise their brother. And Jesus wept and Lazarus came forth. And how came Jesus into the world? Through God who created him and the woman who bore him. Man, where was your part? But the women are coming up blessed, be God. And a few of the men are coming up with them. But man is in a tight place. The poor slave is on him. Women is coming on him. He's surely between a hawk and a buzzard. Over the next ten years, Truth spoke before dozens, perhaps hundreds of audiences. From 1851 to 1853, Truth worked with Marius Robinson, the editor of the Ohio Anti-Slavery Bugle and travelled around that state speaking. In 1853 she spoke at a suffragist mob convention at the Broadway Tabernacle in New York City. That year she also met Harriet Beecher Stowe. In 1856 she travelled to Battle Creek, Michigan to speak to a group called the Friends of Human Progress. Truth was cared for by two of her daughters in the last years of her life. Several days before Sojourner Truth died, a reporter came from the Grand Rapids Eagle to interview her. Her face was drawn and emaciated, and she was apparently suffering great pain. Her eyes were very bright and mind alert, although it was difficult for her to talk. Truth died early in the morning on November the 26th, 1883, at her Battle Creek home. On November the 28th, 1883, a funeral was held at the Congregational Presbyterian Church officiated by his pastor, the Reverend Reed Stewart. Some of the prominent citizens of Battle Creek acted as pallbearers. Nearly 1,000 people attended the service. Truth was buried in the city's Oak Hall Cemetery. Frederick Douglass offered a eulogy for her in Washington, D.C. Venerable for age, distinguished for insight into human nature, remarkable for independence and courageous self-assertion, devoted to the welfare of her race, she has been for the last 40 years an object of respect and admiration to social reformers everywhere. There have been many memorials erected in honor of Sojourner Truth, commemorating her life and work, which includes memorial plaques, busts, and full-size statues. There are resources uh, for Sojourner Truth. Uh, uh, 
libraryweb.org, wesleyan.edu, sec.state, kidsconnect.com, and also Beeham City Schools, and of course Wikipedia, Sojourner Truth. This comes to the conclusion of my show on Sojourner Truth. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email, barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org as I discuss civil rights. Also join Olanian Tabbitt's pre-recorded radio show, which airs by Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.